Hello, I'm Steve Diggle. I'm the founder of Thorpe's Investment Management, an investment manager based in the Cayman Islands with offices in Singapore, Dubai and Geneva. We these days call ourselves an unconstrained investment manager rather than a hedge fund because we do a lot more than just running hedge funds. One of the things is we invest in real assets. And I recently gave a talk at the Global Ag Investing Conference here in Singapore about how despite being an experienced hedge fund manager, I now feel that one of the most compelling trades in the world lies in agriculture. There's been some interest in the talk we gave and so we thought we'd repeat it here for a wider audience. Now at the outset, I have to say I'm very far from being an agricultural expert. In fact, the only direct experience I have of farming is as a £1.50 an hour farmhand on a fruit and pig farm in the village of Elmhurst in Staffordshire, England during the summer of 1980. And the most important thing I learned from that is that farming is a really hard way to make a living. Instead, after college at Oxford, I went into finance. I worked for 15 years for various investment banks, largely as a derivative trader. And then for 10 years, I ran an Asian hedge fund group called Artradis, which I co-founded with a friend of mine, Richard McGiddies, in 2002. And I'm happy to say we made over $2.5 billion for our investors by being correctly positioned for the collapse of markets in 2007 and 8, and being heavily invested in our own funds and our own business, we did pretty well for ourselves too. What I'd like to talk to you today about is how having made that fortune trading, I came to conclude that if I wanted to preserve the real value of that fiat money windfall, I had to get away from trading paper and buy, own and operate real assets with real cash flows, principal amongst them, farms. This is a really strongly held view. It's about as strong as my conviction that the financial world was heading for trouble, which we all held at our traders from 2005 onwards. It wasn't a widely held view at the time. In fact, we were often dismissed as extremists. One investor repeatedly called me a Cassandra. But as I pointed out to him, not only did Cassandra prophesy the fall of Troy, she was right. Looking back from 2012, it seems pretty clear that we were heading for trouble and how you should have been positioned. But it's a cautionary tale that many of those who correctly called for the fall didn't make any money out of it because massive distortions created by central banks and governments meant that some of these positions never paid off. But that's a tale for another time. Back in 2006, most of what now seems obvious was hidden. Back then, you could buy a credit default swap on, for example, UBS, what used to be called the Union Bank of Switzerland, for six basis points for five-year senior credit. Credit default swaps, or CDS, have become a somewhat controversial instrument, but they're simple enough if you understand and like a wager. If you think a company will go completely bust and be entirely worthless, you can borrow and short the bonds, and you keep the whole amount you sell them for. So if you short a bond at 100 and it goes to zero, you get to keep 100. Alternatively, you can buy a CDS. So let's imagine a CDS at 6%. If the bonds go to zero, you make 100. If the company stays in business, you lose 6%. So it works out at about a 16.6 to 1 bet. That's not bad odds for a highly leveraged bank, given the frequency of financial crises. But UBS, which was at the time at least 40 times leveraged, along with many other investment banks, CDS prices weren't 6%. They were just six basis points, or 0.06%. So the seller was giving us effective odds of 1,667 to 1 that UBS wouldn't go bust in a single year, or 333 to 1 over the five-year life of the contract. Now, when you think the longest-lived bank in the investment world is Bearing Brothers, and they only lasted 233 years, and they needed a Bank of England bailout in 1890 to stay afloat, 1,667 to 1 is pretty good odds. And so it proved, as you can see from this chart, at the height of the global financial crisis, the price of this insurance was 60 times what we'd, pay, uh, we'd paid for it just two years before. And it wasn't just banks that this was going on in. It was global, and it was colossal, and it was financial engineering on a scale never seen before, and hopefully never again, and nowhere more so than in the US housing market. The US housing market produced a bewildering array of derivatives, CMOs, CMO squared, CDOs, and so on, but they all rested on the bedrock of a single premise. 
But since the Depression, there has never been a nationwide decline in US residential housing prices. Which was true until 2007. But this historical fact turned in Wall Street's mind into the incredibly dangerous proposition that because there never had been a nationwide decline in US residential house prices, there never could be one. And if that was true, then any degree of leverage was safe. And as the collateral could never be impaired, then any borrower was safe, even one with no income, no job, and no assets, the now infamous ninjas. In fact, in some ways, they're the best ones to lend to because they'll pay more for the loan because they're a subprime credit. And it was in this, the most exposed part of the US housing market, that the whole edifice began to unravel. And when it did, well, it was most impressive, as the bedrock was proven to be sand. Now here's a graph of some previous financial collapses. Bearings went under in 1995, and it cost approximately $1.3 billion. But financial collapse inflation is a powerful beast. By 1998, LTCM had brought the financial world to its knees when what was then considered a hugely leveraged hedge fund needed a massive bailout. $4.6 billion was required to stop what was widely expected to be a financial apocalypse. But just 10 years later, AIG, who'd sold the whole world, those same CDS which my hedge fund was buying, needed $85 billion in credit just to stay in business. And by 2009, that facility had been increased to $182.5 billion, or 140 times what had been required to bail out bearings. And that was just for one company. Incidentally, the only company that never got bailed out was Lehman Brothers, and their CDS ended up paying out $91.38. That's an expected recovery rate for the senior bondholders of just 8.6%. My hedge fund, our traders, had paid just 24 cents for CDS in Lehman Brothers the previous year, giving it a return of 380 times our money. So, our traders have made a huge paper profit, but what now? Well, as the Committee to Save the World faced the ruins of the dreams of the 2000 to 2008 debt field bonanza, I started to reflect on a few things. Firstly, was my own career. So, watch out, Deutsche Bank. But the other lesson is that financial houses, indeed like houses themselves, are excellent for taking on huge leverage, but every so often they collapse. And this last collapse was unprecedented in scale, and so was the coordinated response to shore it up. Now the whole shoddy experience is perfectly demonstrated in miniature by the Irish experience. As everyone knows, the Irish know how to throw a party, and the property party unleashed by EU membership was truly breathtaking as was the leverage taken on by the banks. Anglo-Irish Bank, a bank with just a thousand employees, operating in a country of just four and a half million people, that's about the same size as the state of Kentucky, they blithely reported in December 2008 that lending had increased by 9.3 billion to 73.2 billion euros. The bank also wanted to emphasize its flexible cost base, its capital strength, and its decent profits. 43 days later, the Irish Department of Finance announced that the bank was being nationalised. Anglo-Irish Bank went on to cost the Irish government and its taxpayers over 30 billion euros. That's about $8,700 per person in a country, and that was just one bank. <clears throat> it didn't even have a government guarantee until it was gifted one in September 2008. And thus, the Irish a country that had entered the 2008 financial crisis in good financial shape had bankrupted itself. And this pattern was repeated across the Western world. The scale of the government-coordinated bailout boggles the mind. For if a million is a number that's hard to conceptualize, a trillion is a number that was previously only used by astrophysicists. But Ben Bernanke has so far expanded the Fed balance sheet to $1.6 trillion, and total US government debt as of this month, stood at around $16 trillion. That's a huge pile of $100 bills. So, here I was in 2009, feeling pretty happy about my newly minted pile of US, US dollars, but I really started to worry. Because fundamentally, there are only a few ways that you and I can get out of a mountain of debt. 
Firstly, we could default and declare bankruptcy. Sometimes that's the only option that's left. We can have a campaign of austerity by cutting consumption and slowly paying down debt with excess savings. We can liquidate assets by selling any that have positive equity and so reduce down our debt. Or we can grow by achieving higher income and higher net worth and then through those extra earnings paying down debt. And that's pretty much it. The first three all being pretty painful. But if you're a government and you have a fiat currency no longer tied to a gold standard, you have an option that you and I don't have. And that's the printing press. And given that the first three are all painful and very unpopular in democracies, and that four has so far proved very elusive in the West, I was, and I still am convinced, that option number five is going to be the most popular choice by far. The effect on capital markets so far has been peculiar to say the least, for despite a clear desire to induce mild inflation, government bond yields have fallen to the lowest levels in recorded history. And the S&P 500 has risen back to a five-year high. But very worryingly for me as a trader, flows into funds, other than bond funds, have become very thin, and on-market volumes have simply collapsed. In 2008, running our traders, we found no problem moving $5 billion through Asian derivative markets. I think today it would be hard to deploy 10% of that effectively. The usual playbook for dealing with expected inflation is pretty well understood. You get out of bonds and cash, you buy physical assets, including gold, you buy certain types of stocks, and that's what we started to do. We were a little late buying gold. I take most of the blame for that. Unlike my colleague Grant Williams, I still struggle to understand what gold's for. But eventually, around $900 an ounce, we bought a great deal of gold. And although recently we've switched a lot of that into gold mining stocks, it's been a great investment. But you can't eat gold, and it doesn't give you a coupon. Which brings us on to farmland, which I see as the ultimate store of value. But it's not just as a store of value that I like farms. There's a very strong long-term bullish case for investing in them as well. The single biggest reason to believe productive farmland will be a good investment for the next 20 or 30 years is that the forces which are driving rising global population are very powerful indeed. At the same time, globalization, sometimes seen as a bete noire amongst the left, is helping the bottom half of humanity raise their living standards and with it their diet. Now this doubled up strength of demand with absolute numbers increasing and also those absolute numbers consuming more calories and more meat is occurring against the diminishing supply of usable arable land. We're a very inventive species. and We've managed to delay the Malthusian logic of more people but less land for the last 50 years with a green revolution that's massively boosted yields on any given area of land. But as this chart clearly shows, that one-off boost is fading. Meanwhile, global weather instability, especially the incidence of drought, is rising. Added to these supply challenges, we also, we in the West are facing a generational catastrophe amongst the experts of food production. Farmers are on average getting alarmingly old. Time and again, when we meet farmers who are putting up their farms for sale, we're told the same story. The kids don't want to take on the farm, They've got their own careers in the city. Often there's a postscript. Farming's a hard life. In 2011, the US graduated 200,000 MBAs, but less than 10,000 agricultural students. This lack of farmers will have a profound consequence on food production in the West. And it should be eliciting a strong government response. But instead, we have a succession of terrible, distorting government policies in agriculture. Nowhere more so than in the European Union. Although it represents just 2.3% of European GDP, subsidies consume 46% of total EU spending. 22% of that goes to France, keeping French agriculture, which has some of the most wonderful productive land in the world, horribly small, horribly uncompetitive, and almost entirely dependent on subsidy. By some estimates, 90% of the income of French farmers is subsidy. Although we could go on at great length about other factors, one more that's worth focusing on as a constricting factor that could become extremely important is the availability of fertilizer. We are mining phosphate much faster 
than the natural processes which are producing it. Indeed, the US is likely to run out of mineable phosphate within the next 30 years, even as global demand for, this, for its has soars. As you can see, we're seeing a steady increase in real prices, even faster than the rising prices of food. So, we're looking at some very powerful global trends here. And over the past couple of years, they've grown to be somewhat consensus thinking. And we at Volpez are always very wary of consensus thinking. So, before we waded into agriculture, we wanted to have a look at what might be the risks to this emerging consensus view. Of course, the risks for any specific farm are many. Crop failure, disease, drought, soil erosion, a shift in consumer tastes, overproduction of your, of your product, land seizure, tariffs, export bans, price caps, etc., 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 etc. But what I really want to investigate here are what are the risks to the whole story. Economics 101 tells us, logically, that demand for food is largely price inelastic. So, price will respond strongly to any changes in the equilibrium of supply and demand. Now, on the demand side, it's possible that global population ceases to rise. It's not entirely impossible. Indeed, the nation of Japan now has an organically declining population. Each month, about 24,000 more natural deaths occur than births. That's a small town wiped off the map every month. This is a first for humanity, because we're seeing a population in organic decline in a time of health, peace, and prosperity. Though if, like me, you've been trading Japanese stocks for the last 25 years, you might challenge the term prosperity. But it is a unique event. All other occasions when human populations have declined, they've been associated with catastrophes, such as war. The greatest of which, the Second World War, caused an estimated 27,000 extra deaths every day from the outbreak of war on the 1st of September 1939 to the 15th of August 1945. That's somewhere between 43 and 58 million people, mostly allied civilians. Remarkable testament to our robustness as a species is that even this horrendous loss of life didn't stop global population rising over the time. So it would have to be a massively destructive global nuclear, biological or chemical war to effectively reduce global population. Global famine is a possibility, particularly given the incredibly strong global population growth we're seeing. But as farmers, and potential farmers, we should see this as an opportunity as much as a crisis. In fact, it's probably fair to say, unless we solve a global food production problem, we're not going to see these population increases, particularly as we have increasing weather instability. Now, disease is actually one that we should really be scared of, because we are pretty overdue a global pandemic. And with the world now being so connected, the current interconnectedness means the possible speed of transmission could be faster than anything we've ever experienced before. Yafsinia pestis, or the bubonic plague, has caused a lot of trouble for humanity over the years. Between 1348 and 1353 it killed somewhere between 30 and 50% of Europe's population, and about 100 million deaths globally. That's about 25% of the then global population. And unlike World War II, which didn't even decrease global population, the Black Death took 150 years for global population to recover. Now, I don't think we should be complacent about the risks of global pandemic, but it's very hard to put a probability on it. So, like most of us who live in the shadow of a volcano, I don't think much about it. There are other catastrophes that cause, could cause huge damage. A supervolcano, a massive meteor strike, or indeed any other baroque catastrophe where you might find Bruce Willis as the lead character in the movie. But these are all highly unlikely. It is massively probable that the next 50 years, global population will keep on growing. So the question is, how are we going to feed them? Between 1950 and 1990, the world went through one of its most profound and least noticed revolutions, where men like Norman Borlaug developed hybridized C3 cereal seeds, which combined with improved fertilizers and pesticides, massively increased the productivity of global cereals, allowing the global population to grow by as many as 3 billion people. Only this huge productivity boost to food production allowed the global population to accelerate to today's 7 billion. But ominously, you will notice that this graph has flattened in the 90s and is now almost totally flat. 
despite our inventiveness as a species. And we may well be able to do it again. Some very well-informed people tell me that it can't happen and that the predictive capacity of cereals like wheat has now been reached. Now we could have another miracle, like the Green Revolution, apparently particularly in C4 cereals, and this could forestall an increase in global food prices. But whilst we no doubt will make steady improvements in science and technology of food production, the great leap in productivity experienced in a single generation is now looking like a single unique event. Another possibility discussed is we could see a change in global eating habits. It's a well-known, though slightly inaccurate, fact that it takes six pounds of grain to produce a pound of beef. The numbers are lower for sheep, chickens, or even cows if they're not in US feedlots, but the basic fact is true that vegetarianism would reduce the demand for land in aggregate substantially. So if the whole world were to adopt a vegetarian diet and culture like India, which consumes just seven pounds of meat per capita, compared to, say, the US, which consumes approaching 250 pounds of meat per capita, the price of food could be held down, as that grain that's currently going to animals would go to human consumption. But I see the practical possibility of this as almost nil. Rather, I see all the trends going in the opposite direction. Most people in the world, when they get a bit of extra income, eat more meat. And when the world's largest country goes from poverty to moderate wealth, you get a global change. So I'm putting a very low probability on this. And here I pretty much run out of risk factors. I conclude the world population will almost certainly rise from its current 7 billion to at least 9 billion, and more probably 10 or 11 billion in our and our children's lifetimes. And despite much scientific progress, I don't think there will be another transformational green revolution. And even though it may not make any ecological sense, rising global wealth will mean rising human meat consumption, not falling. And this means only one thing to me, that real food prices will rise for the rest of our lives. And that given massive money printed by central banks, the fiat price of food will rise dramatically. Now, if you have a lump of money, let's say a million dollars, to invest over the long term, let's say 20 years, you have a number of options. Some financial professionals will tell you that the safe thing to do is to buy government bonds. The US government 20-year bond will yield you 2.3% for the next 20 years. That's an income of about $23,000 for your million dollars invested. And then in 2032, the government, if it's still solvent, will return you your $1 million in paper money. That same financial professional might advise you, if you're concerned about inflation, to buy a 20-year TIPS, a Treasury Inflation Protected Security. These give you a coupon based upon the consumer price index, usually plus a bit extra. Only now, the coupon is currently CPI minus two basis points. And then at the end of 20 years, you get your principal back. My current hunch is that $1 million in 2032 will not buy you very much much less than the constantly compounded number of 1.56 million given to you by buying the 20-year government bond and constantly reinvest in the coupons. If we look back over the past 20 years how some prices have moved, we can see some worrying examples. Back in 1992, a gallon of milk cost $2.78, a dozen eggs cost 93 cents, a year's tuition for a Californian at UCLA cost just $1,581. And a box seat at the Yankees cost you $14.50. So today, things are a little different. And when you look at these things in percentage terms, it's even more alarming. So, if you like to sit at home, drinking milk and writing letters, you've done fine. But, if you like to drive to a ball game, inflation has been very harsh for you. And the past 20 years was a relatively benign time for global inflation. The next 20 years, with central bank money printing, endemic, and exported deflation from China's manufacturing explosion fading, could be much worse. Alternatively, you could buy about 150 acres of Iowa land. From that, you'd get 20 crops, or coupons. Each one will adjust for real food inflation, not a Bureau of Labor Statistics invention, like the CPI. 
And in 2032, you will have not a pile of fiat currency, but 150 acres of productive Iowa farmland. I think this is a great bet, but it's not just theory. Back in 2009, I asked a few com committed and passionate experts to start buying farms for my family. They've been very selective, but we now own three commercial free free freehold farming ventures. In Uruguay, where we raise cattle and sheep, Illinois, where we rent the land to corn farmers, and New Zealand, where we produce avocados and kiwi fruit. We're in the process of placing these assets into a Cayman Island joint stock company. Next month, we'll be raising third-party capital to expand our globally diversified farming company. Some people ask, have you missed the trade? There is even talk of a bubble in US farmland. Indeed, in July, we sold the smallest of our Illinois farms, about 650 acres, which we bought late in 2009 for around $3.3 million. At auction, we got 5.1 million. That's an increase of about 55%, not including the two yields we had when we rented it out to a farmer. So, as you can see, the price of farmland has been rising in the US. But if we look at the price not in the rapidly expanding fiat US dollar, but in a more immutable currency of gold, you can see that not only is the price not elevated, <clears throat> it's actually reasonably low. It's about a third of what it was in 1970 and 48% less than it was in 2000. So, I conclude that farming isn't in a bubble. In fact, given its real yields, it's actually still pretty cheap. And globally, we see some real value. So we want to buy, farm, buy, buy farms. We want to buy and improve much more land across the world, and we want to produce a wide variety of food in a wide variety of places, in a globally diversified portfolio of sustainable freehold and long lease farms. We believe that by producing this diversity, we will help avoid the sharp peaks and troughs associated with the ownership of a single farm in a single country producing a single crop. And this will help us to best capture these strong macroeconomic trends we've been discussing. For my money, this is one of the best long-term trades out there and a much better risk-adjusted bet than trading constantly in a diminishing pool of liquidity with global risk appetite constantly shifted by government intervention. And so that's why I say I've learned to trade a bit less and learn to love the farm.